sustainable look at technology and what's the role of governments. Um, I'll start with Emeka. <laughs> Emeka looked at me. Okay, yeah, so um, you've, been, you've been in this in this technology space for quite a while. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, almost 20 years. And uh, you've seen how things have uh, gone over the years. And uh, there's this recent uh, excitement about technology. And, it, and more so from the governments, interestingly. I mean, like a month ago, the vice president was uh, visiting uh, the Yaba Tech community, uh, took a bit of uh, took photos and all of that. And then, uh, like, we've been seeing government attention recently. So, um, to you, what, how, how would you say, what's government seen, like, based on your experience from um, how local tech was back in the day and now? What is that this government seen that is making them all excited about it? What's, what do you see? is just play to hype. I mean, they visited some startups uh, uh, organizations. Um, these startups are entrepreneurial, so uh, they are businesses that scale with technology. Uh, if they are talking about creating, supporting local technology, uh, I don't think they, they really understand what they mean. Because basically, technology uh, is a wide area that has the physical side, the biological side, and the digital side. And we haven't started producing any form of technology uh, that much yet. So government's action are meant to focus on what is needed to start creating local technology. So in our own time, in the early days, they they, they didn't know what technology was. So, and now, you know, they hear too much about startups and, and they think if they support startup that they are supporting local technology. No, that's not true. They, if they want to start to support local technology, they need to go back to the educational system. It's fundamental. You cannot build technology without education. It's not possible. If you check every technology country in the world, their support of technology starts from research. It's the output of the research that entrepreneurs validate to create businesses. You understand? So if they come out and say that they are supporting technology by visiting startup, then we are joking. We haven't started. So the fund we have to go down to the fundamental. So we don't do that. So presently, most of our activities is geared towards building software that drives businesses. But a lot of businesses are not selling software. A lot of businesses are not selling hardware. You understand? A lot of businesses are not creating technologies that solve problems like problems in the soil. Why are our roads, after construction, one season of raining season, they disappear. That's technology, that's biological technology. You understand? We haven't solved electricity problem. We produce electrical engineers who don't solve our problems. And we have electricity problem for 40 years. So what technology are we talking of? So we have to go to the fundamental. They haven't started understanding technology yet. Okay, thank you, Emeka. Um, Benga, so um, Emeka has made some interesting points about going to the fundamentals, uh, education. I understand you are, you are very, been, like in the past, very involved in uh, digital inclusion drive with your tent programs and all of that. But one other interesting uh, uh, fundamental for many of these uh, startups and even technology in general is the internet, right? Broadband, which is actually a, a very big issue as far as Nigeria is concerned. I mean, and you were one of the people who uh, drafted the broadband, national broadband policy, if I'm not mistaken. That was in 2013. The plan was to have 30% uh, broadband penetration by 2018. Now we're in 2018. And depending on who you ask, penetration is between 10 to 21. Depending on who you ask, today NCC will say this. Like, what happened? Why has, why has the policy not been implemented from your own perspective? Because you were there while it was drafted. 
I'm not sure the mic is working. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, 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 I think we're on now. Okay. So, uh, 2013, uh, yes, our, you know, part of a group that put together the program plan, and one of the things that was very clear at the time was that government had two options. Government either got out of the way completely, because as far as we were concerned, and I, and I, I know I speak for a few members uh, of the technical committee, which eventually was almost hijacked by government to be a committee, at which point I resigned uh, for obvious reasons. I don't do politics, I do policy. Um, and what we had in mind was very simple. This thing you called broadband is the new GSM. If anybody understands what happened between 1999 and 2003 to GSM, it was because government got out of the way that telecoms started booming in Nigeria. And that's the same thing that was supposed to happen to broadband. But unfortunately, um, it became a bit political. Uh, one, one of the things that happened at the time was, the first thing that was done was set up a broadband committee, which would have been great if it was an implementation committee. But unfortunately, what you have now is that you're talking about 10% to 21% broadband penetration. Of course, broadband penetration in Nigeria is not 21%. The reason for that is when we put a plan together, what we plan to measure was not mobile broadband. What we plan to measure was terrestrial infrastructure enabled broadband. The minimum was supposed to be 1.5 Mbps and we put a proviso and it was the fact that when you use broadband, it shouldn't buffer. When you use your phone to check, you know, stuff now, say YouTube, for example, as long as it's buffering, that's not the broadband that was defined. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that uh, the numbers are based on NCC's numbers of telecom, you know, uh, SIM cards. Unfortunately, that number that the NCC is counting is wrong because you can't count SIM cards. What you should count are subscribers. And we already have registered our SIM cards. Is there anyone in this room that you happen to register your SIM card? Anyone? The SIM card you're using is not registered. <laughs> anyone? <laughs> no one. So every SIM card is tied to a subscriber. And it means that multiple SIM cards are tied to, you know, to maybe one subscriber. And we can then easily measure the number of people who use the internet. If I ask anyone in this room now, how many internet users do we have in Nigeria? Out here, it is something million, 50 something million, 120 million. Depending on the mood of the government official, you will hear various numbers. And this is the problem. You can never grow what you don't measure. We're not measuring broadband properly. The template is there. But because somebody wants it to sound good, don't forget, this is 2018. 2019 is an election year. Everyone at the NCC, and I hope they can hear this, and I hope someone is tweeting this. Everyone at the NCC, everyone in the ministry is thinking of making the government look good. And that's stupid. Because the problem is we will come back here again in 20, 2020. We'll come back all around 2020, and by 2022, we'll begin to lie to ourselves again. There are three critical things that I think, in addition to education, by the way, one of the reasons why none of the kids that we're raising today are being raised as innovators is because you can never innovate in a secondary language. It's impossible. If you are a traditional Yoruba speaker and you do not understand that there is a reason why the computer is called Eroa it is about the speed. You can't innovate in that area. If you are from the north of Nigeria and you don't understand why it's called Injimai Kwakwalwa, an engine that has a brain, you can't innovate beyond that. Right now, the kids we are raising, they use the iPads. I mean, I see it all the time. I have a three-year-old and a three-month-old, and I see their friends on the phone and on devices all the time. Reality is that they are seeing these devices as magic. Unfortunately, we are still at the level where the Minister of Education announced a few months ago that they will announce uh, instead of emergency in education in Nigeria in April. This is May, so I suspect that the calendar is still in April for them. But in addition to education, that's the truth. In addition to education, there are three critical things. You've mentioned all of them. One is broadband. My argument today, you know, there's, a, there's an argument about, oh, where is the tech capital of Nigeria? My argument is that the three things that would define the tech capital of Nigeria are number one, broadband. The state that is smart enough to invest in broadband will attract more people. I finished from IFE in 2000, I packed my one bag, and I came, 
Yes, if you are clapping, it means you finish from EFF. That bad school. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I packed my one bag and I came to Lagos. You know why? Because this was the place where I knew everyone was coming to. Things would change in the next five years. People will not carry their bags and go to Lagos or go to Abuja. People will go to Kaduna. People will go to Yola. Because when they get there, the speed of the internet will help them do stuff. But not just broadband. The other is bed and the other one is bread. And I talk about these three things like a joke. Accommodation. We say that Lagos is a tech capital. How many young people who leave their schools today can come to Lagos and pay rent? <laughs> I paid 90 naira, 90 naira for accommodation on campus for five years. Well, seven years. <laughs> and I came to Lagos and the first time I asked, three of us as friends were going to get accommodation and they asked us to bring 120,000 naira. Where was I going to start from? From 90 naira to 120,000 naira. One of the biggest problems to, for broadband in Nigeria today, by the way, is the state governments. State governments want to charge right of way. One of the states in Nigeria was going to charge a telecom company 3 million naira per kilometer for them to dig the roads and lay broadband. And I think that's the stupidity of the governor showing up. You know why? Because you are preventing access coming to your state if you generate, if you create a pipe that young people can come towards and create more jobs, you will get more revenue in taxes. Even if you say they are tax free for a while, you will get revenue because more people will come to it. So I think in addition to education, we're looking at things like bread. I mean, when I say bread, I mean food prices. Unfortunately, one of the places in Nigeria that I believe has one of the biggest opportunities for tech is Plateau State. The reason is because it's very close. They are from Joss. <laughs> it's very close to Benue. Unfortunately, no longer the food basket, but maybe it can be the food basket again. It's got a university where people understand technology. I've worked with people from the University of Joss for a while, and I know that even when tech was not a big deal, many of them understood the thing behind the black box. But unfortunately, we're losing all of this potential because many of us are so focused on the sexy side of tech. The one side of tech we're not focusing on, that we must focus on, is to define for ourselves what problems do we want to solve in 20 years. I'm not speaking five years. I'm not speaking 10 years. Nigeria must decide where do we want to be our area of expertise in 20 years and plus. Then we can go back to the schools and then we can go back to the various you know, locations where we can meet young people and build their capacity towards that. We talk about all the different countries today. None of them did this in four years. In Nigeria, we want to do everything in four years because of elections. <laughs> it's not going to happen. If no. anything is going to happen, we're going to build on education. We're going to talk about how to attract new young people to new locations. Lagos is already overcrowded unfortunately and it means it's going to get more expensive abuja people get into abuja with a set of ideas and by the time they get the first government contract they forget the set of idea <laughs> we need new locations where accommodation is not a problem broadband is not an issue and where food is not a problem and education people can think today the shortcut is what everyone is looking for and i hope that i speak to everyone in the audience when i say this Please stop contributing to the mediocrity in Nigeria. Everything shines eventually. You cannot make it shine in one minute. Everybody wants a startup that breaks even tomorrow. It's not going to happen. We must invest, and that we must, you know, do over a long period of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to take, you, you kind of answered uh, some of the questions I was going to ask later, but yeah, I'm going to take it back to the the role of the government again and i was speaking with larry yesterday and uh, he had some very interesting theories about why why um Benga has told us political giving us a political angle to why most of these policies don't work and you're talking about the ict policy 2000 and every other thing every other policy that has come by the government to improve uh, uh, technology and uh, can you share that theory with, with with everyone all right thank you very much now um Nigeria, we, we keep on playing to the gallery. Um, 2000, uh, then um, President Shabba 
former president Tongo Pedro. I know that um, they come up with NNI and NNTI. That was the first policy. And the vision of the policy then was stated that to make Nigeria IT capable and become leader in information technology society in 2005. <laughs> what are we today? 2018. Thank you. <laughs> they, they're not finished. Using IT as a sustainable development and global competitiveness. Now, they now listed the mission. See, Grandma. One, competitive globalization. <laughs> Two, job creation. Three, wealth creation. Four, poverty eradication. <laughs> now, now, I ask myself this question. 2005, this is 2018, when former President Gulodjo uh, uh, came up as well, he changed the NNTI to STI, Science and Technology and Innovation. Now, I ask myself this question. To build any policy and to make it work, forget paper. Three things are very important. People, process, and infrastructure. Now, let's, let's be realistic. We have the people. We have you. Nigerians as them are the most intelligent and smart people that I've ever met on earth. I'll tell you. Why? I'll tell you. I was opportuned, so I studied cybersecurity in the US. And I noticed something. In the class, the people that always want to, you know, push across the edge in the class, they're Muslim Nigerians or they're Muslim Africans. We are just five Africans in the class. And they knew that we were around. You know, when you want to be loud, we'll be loud, right? We are that loud. But we are loud intelligently. And that's why I say that any policy, if you have the people, the issue is do you have the process? The biggest problem in Nigeria is thinking to sit down and create the process. If that process is not created, the people will never know how to work to create something out of that particular thinking of the objective. So our problem in Nigeria is the process and the infrastructure. Why are you writing policy, just a mere book, when you are not ready to execute it? Paper. Why are you using technology for um, a political campaign? It is very clear. So I tell people, I said this, if for instance, the common guy on the street that is trying to learn technology on YouTube, he doesn't even have government to give. Okay, let me remind you. Inside the document, they also mentioned by 2005, technology will be available for all. <laughs> Internet will be available for all. Free Wi Fi at no places. How many places have free Wi Fi right now? Except it's spiritual. <laughs> now, understand clearly. So, what do we have? You have people that are going through a lot of pain to learn technology. They mention education as one of the pivot points that must be enhanced. Hey, guys, you are studying computer science. We are still doing COBOL and Fortran. Who, who does? Who, who is using Fortran? Who is using C programming? I mean, fine. There's a few platforms that still make use of C sharp, right? VB.net framework. But the question I ask is this. If we don't overhaul our, our content at the university, how will students be able to develop research that is enough to be acceptable in the industry? Ask all the platforms, Google, LinkedIn. Most of the platforms are projects from the university, right? And they become a product eventually. Guys that finish from the university right now, computer science, I was talking to one, he was asking himself and said, sometimes he's afraid to even call himself computer science because he doesn't even know what he knows. <laughs> but is he not being sincere? Yeah. He's been sincere. He, 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 has, he said he, he, he never entered computer lab till final year. Whenever they write programs, he will copy it like that, and then the same way, he will copy the program and write it in the exam, and he will get an A, and the program can never run. <laughs> so, we, we, so we have policy and we keep on saying now we have MDG we have changed the MDG now to SDG right? 
in some years to come, whether we will turn it to MDGS. We don't want to deceive ourselves. So I'm going to communicate to you that you are here. And I will, just to end, I'm just going to mention my little story so that you understand. Forget any policy. No policy can help anybody. We will get it one day. The policy, yes, we will get it one day. But maybe that day, I'll be in a data center in heaven. And I'll be controlling from there. Because I tell you, we're in the track. It might just take time. But I'm not sure whether I will still be here. So th this is my little story. Now, I finished my first degree from University of Illinois. And yes, they tried their best to teach us something. But, yeah, we, we, I mean, we, we learned some things. But I'll tell you, they give us this tenacity that you can learn anything. So, so just cut it short. From the background where I came from, um, I did come from a home that has a lot. Yeah, my father has a lot of money, but he married many wives. So, I mean, he cannot, they have to share the cake, right? And sometimes some, some the cake will melt before it gets to your tongue, right? But, but this is the reality. I told myself that you yeah, have strong interest in technology, cyber security, at that. I said, I love this part, and I'm going to focus on this part. So, when you, I have a desire, and along the line, a scholarship came up, mastered in cyber security, and I went for the scholarship. I went for the learning, but that's not where I want to go. Now, when I finished, now, I came out, worked for a while in the U.S., I came back to Nigeria, worked a while as well. But this I want to bring out. University of Illinois, to fast forward, they had an issue in 2016. There are some several attacks. I don't even know about it. I got involved with the vice chancellor of the university, and they said, okay, this is the problem. Um, they want to resolve this issue five times back to back. They've called companies to come and resolve it. They've not been able to resolve it. And I stepped into the picture, and I told them, well, they called me to the Senate. I said, so I'm going to collect nine million. They all shouted in the Senate. But you are a son of the soil. I said, which soil? <laughs> <laughs> the soil, all right? I, I, I only went to Cora State to study, right? I, 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 I'm never from Cora State. So, by and large of the talk, so they paid about five point something million eventually. And I called the Vice Chancellor. I said, sir, I've collected all my school fees back, right? He laughed. I'm not stopping there. I went back to my hotel that evening. Four of the lecturers, three professors, they came to my room. They sat on the bed. I mean, where they lodged, they lodged me. And the guy said, ah, he has heard a lot about me, this and that, he has read my profile. He wouldn't mind. In my mind, I said, this guy puts me through a level. The other one taught me for a level. And the guy said, Larry, what I want from you is I need you to mentor me. I, I'm telling you the truth. He said, I need you to mentor me. This is a doctor. He said, because your field, I've seen a lot of stuff you've done. I need you to just mentor me. And I asked myself. The difference between myself and this guy, academically, this guy is higher than me, right? But the difference is, when technology moves, this guy has not moved, right? And so, so the, the thing is this, technology is a moving train. And we are easily moved by money. Do not be moved by money, be moved by value. Something that, something that is very important is this. I was talking to a friend, a guy, he said, I want to be a developer. Oh, I think I love development, it's my passion, I love to solve problems, I like to do this. Okay, so he says, well, you are in cyber security. So he spent some few time with me. So there was a contract that I got, and I was supposed to do it for just one week, a cyber security contract. And so I, the invoice has been done, so they now pay, they pay using a check. So he was there. So they gave me a check for the job of one week, and they gave me five million. And the guy now asked, is this the same job we came for daddy they gave you the money he said yes he said five million so he was silent this is why the guy now said i think my passion is cyber security <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> now so 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 to, to end and so the what so what brought the passion is the money right but i want to put it out to you passion. Our policy in Nigeria might not be right enough for you as an individual to want to say that policy will work to you. You are in the grassroots. The vision of Nigeria, the technology we are looking at, is going to come from you. But you are going to go through some pain and pay some price. True. You will have to go, yeah, be ready to pay those price. I was just telling, I was him, I was mentioning too. Last week, 
or last two weeks, Microsoft Global Summit 2018. You can go online, I'll make the link available. I was the only black and a Nigerian that was selected globally to be a subject matter expert at the summit in the US. Now, that now tell me, and I ask myself, I, I, since after that time, every day people check my profile because they wonder, who is this guy? But I now ask myself, this same person, me that from somewhere, somewhere around in Nigeria, how did I find myself in this place? It means that all those little things that I'm doing, are you getting it? Come to become that level. So I'm now telling you, watch the YouTube. Spend the money to go ahead and buy the internet. It might be very painful. You are paying a price. A time will come that you become that Nigeria, people will learn to call your name. And that is what we are talking about, exporting what we have outside the country. Okay. I think I'll stop here. Yeah, so, so the general sense I'm getting from everybody now, Shewe, is that we don't need government. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so budget, has, budget, for example, has partnered with government many times in the past. I remember the Kaduna State uh, Open Data thing. So I, 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 I might not fully agree that maybe we don't need government, right? But what's your view on that? Like, for example, how were you able to convince uh, Kaduna states, I think Edo states too, I think, you know, to work with you? And what is your own view on how, um, what government is supposed to do to encourage what people are doing? Is, is it working? Hello. Okay. Well. All right. So, uh, I hope you... It's not I don't think it's working. Can we get a mic? Yeah? Okay. Alright. Uh, Still. Can we get a handle back? Okay. Okay. Alright. In any society, you would know that there's always a civil society, the private sector, government. Um, and I always tell people the biggest mover or the biggest bike transforms society um, is the government. Start with the government as a base drop. Then you can build the private sector and lay on it. You can have a very dysfunctional, if you have a very dysfunctional government and you have a very, very energetic private sector, there will still be a mismatch somewhere. So, we can have a private sector that can build a Convenance University, a Bowen University, and make them technology centers and excellence centers. But a student from OAU, Futa, Unijos, would, would not have that opportunity if you don't feed the private public. So for me, we need to put more attention on government. And I think it's been said, there's no way we are going to fix technology without fixing the education. That's, it's no-brainer. And... You know, and when Buari chose, so you are calling names, but when Buari chose his favorite columnist as the Minister of Education, <laughs> you will know that we are not a serious country. Yeah. And this is someone that wants to declare emergency and gives you a four month notice. So there's a problem. And that's my own thinking is number one, we need to put much more attention about the quality of education that we are getting. Stanford is, has been crucial to the development of Silicon Valley. You know, Caltech has been crucial to the development of California. Boston with all the Harvard and MIT and, 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 and all the technology students there. That's very critical. The second thing for me is broadband, which Dinga has also said. There's no way we're going to advance if we don't put down front or we don't put the infrastructure, enable the infrastructure. And Yaba has been an example of that which is early stage May 1 and Lagos State came up together to say, we're going to wave the right of way for you to pass broadband through this area. And that's how helpful government can be. And, and I think that's what we need right now. And it all comes about political leadership. Most of the things about government, so if you see us doing open budget system when we try to revamp budget system in Kaduna to do some work with them, it's because the political leadership is much more enthusiastic about things like that. Um, and that's why... We should not vote analog leaders. Yeah, it's true. We are in the digital age, but we are voting analog leaders. There's going to be a mismatch somewhere. We need to put our foot down and say, analog protest. <laughs> Yeah.
I think the analogy that's got here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So we, we cannot, we, we can't, we that, that's the second mismatch we have. And that's transmitted to the entire policy of government. So you don't just have a 31 year old MIT graduate as their CIO. We don't have a CIO. So the whole idea of government does not really support innovation. Because the whole idea of Nigeria is not wired around innovation. That's the first thing we have to really now understand. The whole idea of Nigeria is wired around sharing and distribution. <laughs> yeah. It's wired around contracts. So, if you are looking forward to government as our permanent solution to change stuff, we will wait for a long time. We can agitate by the sidelines, we can continue to ask questions, but the most element for us to start is start with ourselves, which is something he has said. Then we go ahead and find who are the ones in government that is so much more enthusiastic about the issues that matter to us. So being as said Kaduna, I know Kaduna is doing something with the World Bank, with Rockefeller, around digital jobs recently. I'm from Oyo State. I've never heard my governor talk about anything called digital jobs, you know, except harassing you know, young students and saying, don't know who I am, I'm the constituted authority. Yeah. You know, you shut down your whole university for a, almost a year and a half. Who does that? So the question is, there are states that are going to advance forward. And Ninga comes back to that, which is, maybe you have done me a bit of disservice by speaking last. The, the states, but it's also good, you know, the states that already are going to be leaping forward because they understand the role of technology to transform the space in their society. But where are we going to start from? We need the right talent. We need the right environment. We need the right policy. For us to wait for Nigeria might not be possible. Um, and, and it's coming about why we want to build a house from the top. We have the vice president you know, visiting tech startups, visiting tech ops. Well, it's fine for validation. But is that, really, is that really what we want? Is that our biggest problem? Is there a law of listening to say, is that the biggest problem? Why do we have computer science departments the same way they are? Why do we have enough startups that come up and seed funding? seed funding like you know recently i think the national assembly was given 10 billion naira to buy cars or something like that we have startups struggling to even raise twenty five thousand dollars to even validate their proposition and so that's where government are supposed to come for guys okay we'll take the early stage risk and something that lagos state is trying to do with lagos innovates now we take the early stage risk for a while when is when you know you are ready for a VC or for an equity investor on the red. And those are the kind of ways that we might not be able to wait for Nigeria. Maybe our biggest hope is to look for the bright stars among the states and be able to say, okay, who are we going to work on there? Because, like I believe, the idea for Nigeria is not about innovation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so from what I'm getting at is, um, generally, is, um, why we should not wait for governments? If we see visionary leadership or um, digital leaders, for example, then we should work with them. So I, I see everybody here being a potential digital leader. So I want to put us on the spot quickly. So, Emeka, for example, say, this is for everyone, say you are running for governorship of your state. And as a cryptocurrency enthusiast, we heard that the Nigerian Senate wants to regulate cryptocurrency. I don't know why they want to, something they don't understand. <laughs> they want to regulate. <laughs> But say you are the one in the, you are the one in their shoes and you are in the Senate, for example. How would you regulate cryptocurrency? Um, okay, so I I want us to address uh, to ad answer that question. Um, you hit the nail on the head that they don't understand and they want to regulate. Uh, just like uh, Winga mentioned about uh, the governor that wants one million naira or three million per for per kilometer. He doesn't understand what the broadband is used for, but he wants to make money. Uh, comes to what uh, uh, Sean was also saying. But it's, people don't understand the value, but they, on, they see money. So they are rent seekers. That's what we do in Nigeria. Rent, seeking rent, rather than thinking about the value we are supposed to create. So am I going to be happy today if Nigerian government gives a policy on technology or cryptocurrency. No, because we don't have a civil service that understands what this whole technology is all about. 
our civil service, which is the core of government now, we are not even talking about the political class because we need to understand that the core of government is the civil service. They, they are still stuck in the second industrial revolution. And this is the fourth industrial revolution. So first of all, they don't even understand the gains of internet or broadband, you know, the value it could bring, the opportunity it could create. So for me as a governor, first of all, I have to think whether these legislators understand this cryptocurrency. Because if they do, then it's helpful. So we can create a legislation for cryptocurrency, not only for um, uh, uh, monitoring what's going on in the cryptocurrency space, but also to regulate the use of the underlying technology called blockchain. So, which is one area that I'm interested in. So take for instance now, people have data inside the blockchain and there are legal issues. Then the court of the land should recognize the information in the blockchain and be used to sort those issues. Now, when you have those kind of regulations, it brings businesses who will want to now start building on top of the regulation. There are a lot of businesses that will run on blockchain regulation. You know, take for instance, landlord association or even an estate and all that. So it creates opportunity. But sadly, we, we don't have the people who understand that regulating this thing should be more about promoting innovation, which is something called smart regulation. Like in the previous panel or the other panel where you had Julius, Julius mentioned about Kenya Central Bank. Their own is do, let us see what it is. See, that attitude is a very beautiful attitude. It's called smart regulation. But we have here in Nigeria where they say, oh, don't do it. In fact, don't do, you know, because of pride and ego. And you know, some, we Nigerians at times, a lot of us don't like to say we don't know. Rather, they will tell you that thing will not work. If I don't bother. That's what's killing us. That's the difference between mobile money in uh, Nigeria and mobile money in Kenya. So the thing is, our attitude. So even as a governor now, some of us are looking at what's going on in the political space. So we're all talking about presidency. Let's be honest to ourselves. If my late uncle Ghani Fahami became the president and he had this bunch of legislators in the house, how much can he achieve? They can even impeach you. It's just numbers. They can impeach you. The point is, we need to understand the dynamics of what we want. Now, I want us to go back a little bit. She mentioned about the Minister of Education. We have not even talked about the Minister of uh, Technology. So, um, now, <clears throat> we, we are in a very bad cycle and I need you guys to listen to this and I'm sorry to be the bearer of uh, bad news but I have to say it the reasons why governments come into power is that they need to define their, asp their aspiration of the society in the educational sector so that the people that want to take over government will be trained from the school the people that will take over the political space will be trained from the school the people that will take over the private sector will be trained from the school based on this policy. But, you know, we've been in this cycle where politicians don't want people to take over their space. They don't want people to also take over their business space. They don't even want you to come into the government. So we have a system that is producing... I don't know whether to speak French. Shit. You know, and it's being circulated. There might be few people like the likes of Benga, my guy here, and Co, who will break out of that cycle. But we are not enough. There are not enough Bengas in the system. So it's a, it's a cycle that is going on. And if we don't break it, and the place to break it is these politicians. Because they need to go in there and define that we need our electrical engineers to build a better pass my neighbor in 10 years time. That is what research does. And the product comes into 
being able to build generators that will solve our electrical problem. We've been solving electrical problems since 1975. In fact, what have we solved? Our educational system is where, look, he's mentoring his professor. Oh, sorry, doctor. Yeah, anyway, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> he's, mentoring, he's mentoring some people who are supposed to mentor the people that will come and fix our problems or whether their problems will be fixing their own problems. It's the system we found ourselves. This is not funny. We are 180 million people. China, you know why China got it right? China is the fastest country to be, become a global, a, a technologically global country. The fastest. They did it in 18 years. China's GDP was bad before. But how did they get it? As at last year, the Prime Minister of China is reading books on AI and FinTech. Do I need to go and ask my president what he read 10 years ago? No, uh, I won't bother. The Congress, the Chinese Congress, People's Congress Party, in their Congress, they discuss AI, they discuss Bitcoin mining, they decided among themselves that miners should leave China. Why? I mean, that's the level. You want to know what PDP and APC are thinking in their... We shouldn't bother. Okay, so these people now come. So we have the kind of ministers we have. What are we trying to achieve? We're achieving nothing. We're doing nothing, achieving nothing. The school is doing nothing. That's the mess we are. That's the bad news I'm about to share, that I've shared. Thank okay, you. so unfortunately we are kind of short for time. So I just want to take two questions from the audience and we just added, any of you, just two questions, please. Uh, yeah. Can we get a mic? Just two questions. Any of anybody can answer. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steven. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, my question is, I mean, uh, prior for, like growing up, I've been hearing of the defunct government, then still old enough like this, it's still the defunct government, and of course the old school, of, the old news about school. Who's your question? Okay. Yeah. Now, since we have functional companies in Nigeria in tech doing stuff, why don't we do what those other companies in the Western countries do, and then maybe come together and set up something that so has... is that a question or a it, suggestion? No, I'm asking a question. Why is it not done? Just ask a question. Yeah. Okay, like, why are the tech companies in Nigeria not coming together to set an in-university structure that allows students to work towards a particular stuff? Like, if, say, work on producing... Okay, like, I got your okay, question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Second question. Good day. Please straight to your question. Yeah, my name is um, Samuel. You came Samuel. I want to ask a question. You know, we 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 say our school system is corrupt. I won't say my school, my school name. But I I, I was in class a day and my lecturer said something. He said, "Question, please." I, question. I, I know. It's question, crazy. question. Okay. Or I'll cut you off. Question. Okay. W what I want to ask is, we are talking about change, change, change. That the technology point, our government, the policies, and everything. How do we want to change a government that? discourages the youths. Now, we are, in, we are in a system where... Okay, how do you want to change the government that discourages the youths? As in... That's fine. Right. Thank you. No. Go straight to your question. No, that's what I want to ask. Yeah. As in, we, as in people that, that go outside now, mm. and they come, they go outside to school, and then they come back to Nigeria. We that were in Nigeria, yeah, that were schooling, I'm not saying it's bad, but how do we enter a government that, like for, to contest the president now, you must be 40 years old. People that... Seven, seven something years old. How do they want to change something they don't know about? That we, that we are that we are in our early twenties. How are we going to enter a government when they don't even set standard for we to enter the government itself? Okay, thank you for the question. So the first question is why are the tech companies not coming together? And then the second question is how do we break into government? Okay, Shane wants to answer. I, I'll take the second one. Okay, the second one. Oh, okay. okay uh, Alright, maybe he wants to. So he wants please, to let's take an answer okay. quick. So, yeah. No, sorry, I said two questions only, please. I'm okay, sorry. So can I answer, can I answer the first question? 
Okay. No, no, Shewu is there. Uh, Shewu wanted to answer the second question. Okay, let me, let me take the second question. And, um, and thank you for that question. Um, I think we need to do a start-up of the Nigerian politics. Does anybody believe we can do it? We need to turn the Nigerian politics into a start-up. And that's the only solution. It's never going to come in the way the current structure is happening. And if we are bold enough to do it, we can do it. Every political party, Action Congress, the first party, Action Group, was a startup. Because just a few people came together and they scaled in the entire region. So we have Gov Tech, we have Civic Tech, we have all the techs in the world. What says we can't have Polytech? So I think that's what we need to do. We have AI, we have deep learning, we have machine learning, we have data science. We can get the data of Nigerians. We know there are problems. We can do the pattern recognition. We can do the predictive modeling. So why are we not selling to them? That place is ready for disruption. And we are the ones that are going to step up and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Oh, yeah, all right, all right. Just, just, um, just, just a response to the first question. Let me ask you first. Uh, you're asking a question that all the companies, tech companies should come together, create a university or something that people can be educated and all that. Now, every organization opened their shop to make money. We have almost 90% SMEs in Nigeria. The company that you think is a big company, globally, they are SMEs. Some of them are even startups. So they're all trying to survive. How many tech companies in Nigeria, when, when the likes of Microsoft started, you never knew about them? When you heard that they have university, IBM has university, do you know how many years they've been operating? And the government of the US, they support most of them. So the question is, understand clearly first that we have a lot of startups and SMEs in, in Nigeria, and their focus is to make money first. When they make the money, then they can think of, okay, can we now change the society and do some proper social um, responsibility? The only thing they should do right now is to create a bridge between the university and the industry by taking more interns. So they can give us some experience. I will say, NYC is fantastic. But why do you want to make people unemployable in one year? So I will say this. Organizations should come in at that point. Pick some people. Give them internship. After that one year, you have transformed your life forever. That's for me. Okay, thank you, Larry. I think that was okay. Um, so, I, I understand the frustration in the second question. But I also think it's, it's probably the same reason why many companies are not getting involved. Because people want to survive, like you said. The, the three things I think we must have as reaction to policy. Policy, and I don't want us to live here thinking, oh, government is effed up, policy, no-go area. Three things. Number one is, please cause the darkness when you see it. When policy is nonsense, say it as it is. Many times, because government is the biggest contractor, many of us hypocritically, I have been in some of these meetings where people should call out nonsense hypocritically massage the echo of the DG so they can get a contract. As young people, please do not join that stupid trade. Build a brand that does not need government to survive. And I think that's easier these days because your market is not just Nigeria. The second is, apart from causing the darkness, is to light a candle, show them how it's done. Many years ago, we approached a few governments and said, this is the way education should be done. Unfortunately, the response was, are you saying we have failed? And what we did between <laughs> then, 2007 and now, in three locations across Nigeria, in Kano, in Aba, in Lagos, and in Ajegunle, is to demonstrate how it can be done. The stories of how a young person whose parents have told them, you are nothing. You, you know what? I don't have any money beyond secondary school. Go and find your way. So that young person becoming globally relevant, it is possible. It is not a sprint, but it is very possible in your own little area. Build, let's not all, you know, join the train, everything is bad. Build something that can light a candle, that can show what can be done. And my final point is, I think it's about time for us to go big or go home. One of the reasons why it looks like, and you're right to say that many of the companies we, you know, many of us like to think we are big. But reality is that we're not as big as we think we are. We need to work more together. When we work more together, 
then we can demonstrate what can be done on a larger scale. If I reach 1,000, if you reach 1,000, you reach 1,000, you reach 1,000, that is nothing compared to the millions that we can reach. So I think it's high time, not just causing the darkness or lighting the candle, but for us to work more together and demonstrate what's possible. Thank you very much for your insights, everyone. Please, let's appreciate the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, photo of this.